The scripture this morning is Acts 9, verses 1 through 22. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he journeyed, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him, and he fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him were speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him to, into Damascus. And for three days... He was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight and inquire in the house of Judas for a man of Terrace named Saul. For behold, he is praying and he has seen a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to thy saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call upon thy name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and took food and was strengthened. For several days he was with the disciples at Damascus and in the synagogues immediately he proclaimed Jesus saying, he is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called on his name? And he has come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. The word of God for the people of God. Yes, with that encouraging note, I want to welcome you uh, to our sermon series, Empowered to be Witnesses, Empowered by the Holy Spirit to be Witnesses for Jesus Christ. And we are taking this series from the book of Acts, learning about our own history. How come the church is still existing? How come the church is still moving forward? How did it all begin? So, uh, so this is what we were looking and we are looking in the last, uh, for the last three weeks and we'll continue today. Uh, but before we move on, uh, uh, something related to the message today I have on the screen and I want you to pick one thing out of this. Just stare at the screen. Okay, to pick two. Some of you will say, only one, I like that too. Pick one or two.
Did you pick? Or oh, still selecting? You know, sometimes we go uh, for shopping and we want to buy one thing, we spend three hours and still it's not done. Shall I change the screen or you're good? Did you pick? Don't tell me what you picked. But did you pick? Now let me ask you, why did you pick that? Don't tell me, but just think. Was there any purpose behind that? Was this something to do with the value? You know, when you're looking at the screen, maybe you're looking at something you need. Maybe something you want. It may not be your need, but something you want. But behind that, you're wrestling with two things, value and purpose. Value and purpose. And just keep that at the back of your mind as we move on with the sermon title today. And that is Empowered to be Witnesses. And the subtitle, which will be our focus, is cho Chosen Instruments. So when you were looking at the screen, you were valuing something. Some things you didn't even uh, you know, think those were worthy for you to just choose. And some of you will say, I didn't even like anything here. Right? Is there anyone who said, uh, who thought uh, maybe I didn't pick anything from there? Anyone here? Because I didn't put everything that you want to have. Or the things you value. Or the things that will give purpose uh, uh, you know, for your life. But the reason for that was to just start thinking about our own selves. What, when do you look at yourself? Do you think you are worth? You are valuable? You are purposeful? That's where we are going today. So in this last three weeks, what we have seen, how Jesus began his church. On the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God comes and these people begin to experience the presence of God because the Spirit of God is the presence of God. And they did not just remain in that comfort of the presence of God. They took the step out so that others can experience the presence of God. And that is the beginning of the church. Church is not your creation or my creation. It's not your idea or my idea. It's God's idea. It was God's design. It was God's desire to bless the nations. That's why Jesus said, stay here. Be empowered. Stay in the city. You shall be my witnesses. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So that's where we were in the first week, and then we moved on, just taking something uh, uh, from among the chapters, and we looked at uh, how a 40-year-old man who was crippled and sitting there at the gate named Beautiful, how God had purpose for him. And when John and Peter looked at him and said, silver or gold, we don't have, and we just took the message from us that we may not have uh, silver or gold to give to the world, but the church has Jesus Christ to give to the world that silver and gold cannot buy. Amen? We can give temporary solution uh, to the problems of this world, but we give eternal blessing to the world when we give Jesus Christ. And that's why the church exists. Church does not exist to be a social club or social group. We exist, we breathe because God has placed us to tell about the good news of Jesus, to bless. It doesn't mean we just simply talk about Jesus, but all that we have, with that we give Jesus to the people. If we only give the material things, then we are not better than or maybe lesser than even a social work organization because social work organizations are doing a better job than most of the churches. So that was second week. What was last week? Do you remember that? Good news to the? Good people. Thank you. You get A+. Plus. Good news to the good people. You know, there's another dilemma that we have. Who should hear the good news? Is this for the wretched sinners? Or is this for all? So last week we were looking at Cornelius' life who was a very righteous man. Even angel of God appeared to him. God heard his prayer, but the message did not change. And that message was, if Cornelius needed to be fixed, then each and every person on this planet Earth need to be fixed, means needs Jesus. Amen? 
So the message of Jesus Christ is not just for a handful of people, for a religious sect called Christians. It is for all because everyone needs to experience the love and the forgiveness of God. No matter how good you are, how righteous you are. So I'm kind of uh, giving you some kind of, uh, you know, some uh, highlights from last two, three weeks. I see some new faces in the crowd, so I hope that you will catch up. And we have the sermons online as well. Now we are moving forward, and today I would like to talk about a terrorist. You know his name? A terrorist, his name is Saul. Who is a terrorist who terrorizes people, simply speaking? You know, sometimes we think, St. Paul, let's, let's honor him. But before we honor him, let's look at his life. He was terrorist. He was terrorizing Christians. If you just simply read, it says, right in the beginning, On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. Saul began to destroy the church going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women, uh, uh, women and put them in prison. Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So here we see, last week we were looking at a righteous man who was good, and still Jesus' love was being poured out for that good man. Previously we saw for a crippled man who did not have any hope, Jesus' love was for him. And today we are looking at Christ's love for a terrorist who was doing anything and everything against the church and against the Lord. How can God love this person, we would wonder. You know, we want to round up all the terrorists in this world, right? And say, hey, we want to give them punishment so that there will be peace in the world. There will not be any violence in the world. But we, here we see that God is showing his reckless love to this terrorist. So I, I think we are going to have a little bit of change of perspective when we look at people and we look at people with hope that if Paul, the Saul, the terrorist, can have hope of a new life, then each and every person in this world, no matter how worse or bad they have been, have hope. Amen? So we are still in the introduction section at the moment here. But I just wanted to give uh, you know, another scenario that today we are looking from the book of Acts. Christ's love is spreading, not just geographically, culturally, racially, across the board. He is also looking at each and every individual who is in need of his love. So Christ's love is for each and everyone on this planet Earth. Now, there are a few things that I would like to draw from this passage that we have. And uh, I would like us to start right here. As you know that this man called Saul was on the way to Damascus to round up all the Christians so that he could punish them, jail them, persecute them. And on the way to Damascus, Jesus showed up. Jesus showed up because Jesus can show up anytime, anywhere. You cannot you know, make a distance from him. Sometimes we think Jesus may show up only in the church. No, Jesus can show up anytime and anywhere in your life. If you're trying to keep a distance, I would say don't do that because he's going to show up in your life. All you need to do is take your guards off. You know, people, those who are not stubborn, no matter how against they have been to God, if they're teachable heart, not stubborn, there's great hope for them. This is a great example. Here we see that Jesus showed up. And the scripture also tells us that this is the revelation of God. If you want to know who God is and how he acts, how he relates to people, there's no better way than his own revelation that we see in the scripture. Here we see that Jesus showed up. What does Jesus say? Can we read only the red part? Saul, Saul, why are you 
persecute me? Why do you persecute me? That's the first thing. Was, was Saul persecuting Jesus or the church? Please. Jesus or the church? In reality, you know, if you see from human eyes who were being persecuted. People of God, right? We don't see that Paul was directly hitting Jesus. But Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? So the beautiful passage, first of all, tells us that whenever God's people are hurt, God feels the pain. And I just wanted to begin with that before we go into Paul's story further. That when God looks at us, whatever pain and suffering we are suffering for his name's sake, or anything we are going through because we are called by his name, and we still trust in him and say, Lord, I trust in you even though I go through difficulty, God also feels that pain. Amen? So anything you are going through in your lives, I just want to say, if it's, it's just the persecution to the believers, it is much more than that, that God knows each and every situation and circumstances of your life. And it hurts when you are hurt. It's almost like when kids are going through a difficult time, whose, whose heart is hurting? Parents' hearts are hurting. And sometimes we say, I wish if I could take your pain, your suffering, your sickness. This is the revelation we see in this passage that the book of Acts also tells us that God is the love, God is the God of love. When his children suffer, he is also feeling that pain. Now, with this, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. I want to move on and I want to just focus on Apostle Paul's life. And let's see what's going on. After that incident, Apostle Paul goes blind. And in that period, Jesus approaches Ananias and tells Ananias, Ananias, go to Paul, this, the person Saul from Tarsus, and tell him about me. Heal him. And Ananias is terrorized at this because he knows he's from Damascus that this guy is coming to persecute me. But God has chosen an instrument called Ananias to bring gospel to Paul. So here we are. Ananias is arguing with Jesus. Jesus, don't you think it's a wrong thing? It's a bad idea? At times, you and I argue, God is nudging our heart and say, tell your neighbor, tell so and so. And you say, no, he is an atheist. No, he doesn't like Jesus. No, he is against Christianity. No, he is that and this. And meanwhile, God is nudging your heart and say, go and tell, I have already started my work in somebody's heart. Amen. This is how the gospel spread, friends. Today we are sitting because of those faithful nudges from God and obedient by the people like Ananias who were willing to take the risk and go. From the book of Acts, if we are learning something major, and that is how God wants to carry on the work so that you and I may not sit here. Amen. But we may feel the nudge. It may be your colleague, it may be your friend, it may be your neighbor, it may be whoever. But if God is nudging you, instead of arguing, just be obedient. When we begin to be obedient, God is going to do great work. We are still not in Paul's life yet. Now let's go and go even more narrow. After Ananias argues and he gives up because what did Jesus say? Let's read it together. Amen. Here we are. We can only see just one step in our life, but God sees the whole picture. God has chosen Paul for his purposes. And what does it say? He is my chosen instrument. If God can choose this instrument who is going all out against the church, against the Lord, then God can choose anyone and everyone for his purposes. Amen. 
Here we see that Paul is going against God and God is turning his life around. The city he's going to persecute is the city, the first city where he becomes the witness for Jesus Christ. God's hand is not short, but God allows some things sometimes for his purposes, but he's also the God of intervention. God who intentionally chooses people. If you're sitting here, I just want to say with confidence that God has chosen you. You are God's chosen an instrument because Jesus said no one can come to the father except when I reveal himself myself to him if you are sitting here each one of you are God's chosen instrument you know when you think about some, choosing something you immediately add value and purpose to that if God valued this terrorist he gave him the purpose of his life. If God valued you to reveal himself to you, then you are valuable in God's sight and you have a purpose. Just turn to your neighbor and say, you are God's chosen instrument. Tell your neighbor, this is the truth. Can we just say with confidence? That I am God's chosen instrument. It's very hard for us to understand that. But unless and until we believe in the scripture and say, God, I believe that I am your chosen instrument, we cannot live purposeful life. From God's perspective, here we are looking at this Paul. The message is coming. Message is clear. That Paul, you may have your own agenda, but I have my purposes for you. God's reckless love for Paul is so great, no matter how much he has gone against him, how much he has been rebellious, yet God's great love is for Paul. No matter what you have done in your life, but God's great love, that has determined that you are chosen and God has a purpose for your life. Unless you, unless you and I begin to feel that value and worth and purpose in our lives, it will be difficult for us to move forward in our lives. The scripture says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And I want to stay here a little bit more. The reason for that, because most of us, I think the purpose of our life is to find comfort and luxury. Or the majority of the world, the purpose and the direction of their life is to find somehow comfort and luxury of our life. As if we act, as if we behave, the only purpose is comfort and luxury and safety. But Jesus said, I have chosen this instrument and I will show him how much he has to suffer for my name. It changes the perspective of our life. Where are we going with our life? Are we looking at our lives from God's perspective that one day he has kept a day of rest for us for eternity? Or are we looking to do everything comfort and luxury in this life? I would say it's a little bit of challenging and hard message and even boring at times. But God can save a terrorist then he has a purpose for you and for me you and I are valuable in his sight it was God's purpose in Paul's life and Paul's obedience that came to us with blessing and came to the world as a blessing I just want to show you that this person who was going against God, when he turned around and surrendered his life, he was the one who went around and preached the good news in his first, second, and third missionary journeys till the end of his life. He lived with the purpose God has placed on him. He was God's chosen instrument. When you hold the scripture, you know, around 48% of the scripture in the New Testament is coming from Paul's pen. The one who personally experienced Jesus, 
the one who heard him the one who was inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's why when we look at the scripture, we cannot just say, so and so wrote, was probably an intellectual person, a, a great philosopher, or a good religious man. But the word of God comes to us because God's revelation was placed on jo uh, Apostle Paul. Each and every author in the New Testament, when you look at, each and every one had a touch with God's servant and directly touch with God. Knowing why God chose Paul should help us to go back to the scripture and say, I want to know more about it. Last scripture that I want to share with you. Let's read it together. It is Paul's personal testimony. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me, abounding abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5.17 he writes, those who are in Christ, they are a new creation. Because Paul's personal experience transformed his life, transformed his purpose, that he could only say that I am standing today not because I am a great intellectual person, great rigorous religious leader, because God has made me a new creation. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. When Jesus was speaking to his people, uh, people, uh, uh, his disciples in John 15 verse 16 he said you did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit fruit that will last and so that whatever you ask in my name the father will give you friends I just want to conclude with this if Apostle Paul found a new life, new purpose, new direction for his life, then you and I are sitting here, we also have God's new purpose, new direction for our lives because we are God's chosen instrument. If Jesus says that I have chosen you, then you may say, why it was my free will. Absolutely, that is our Methodist theology. Goes both hand in hand. Where Paul is being revealed of Jesus. Yet, he had the choice whether to be a stubborn man like all the Pharisees were or to surrender his life and say, God, I accept that you chose me. And today as we sit in his presence, we may have the same choice. Maybe some of you are not even believers yet. Maybe you are just wondering whether this Christian thing is just one of the sects or really it is the message of salvation. Maybe if you will just humble yourself and say, Lord, I come before you. Pray, change the trajectory of my life. Give me purpose. Give me purpose. You know, so many of people, they take their lives because they lost the purpose in their lives. How many of you have heard about uh, Anthony Bourdain? Just in CNN news, he was, okay. Recently, he took his life. You know, as I was watching his uh, little bit of documentary and uh, w several questions he would ask people, especially related to their happiness with food. At the age of 61, he took his life. He looked the happiest person in the world who has all the best thing he can achieve, all the money that he has. You know, in one of the clips I heard him say that, you know, I had everything, but there was something missing in my life. And I'm giving you very fresh from CNN right now. One of the clips, if you watch, he says, I had something missing in my life. And I wondered how many of the people around him were willing to give him the gospel and tell him, Anthony, you're missing Jesus Christ in your life. When you miss Jesus Christ in your life, you miss the purpose of your life. You miss the direction of your life. You miss the value of your life. The value that is attached to your life is because Christ died on the cross and he valued you. You are chosen. Amen. Now you turn to your neighbor and say, you are chosen instrument of God. I tell you, once we, we try to confess it, 
it's going to change your direction. If you're not, you're going to find purpose. Because if you don't know that you're chosen by God, you value in his sight, and you have God's purpose in your life, I guarantee you, sooner or later, you are trying to find other purposes for your life. And someday you will say, my life is empty. And the book of Acts, chapter 9, tells us about a terrorist who found the value and purpose in his life. If he is a chosen instrument, you are a chosen instrument. Will you live with the value and purpose of your life? Let's pray. Almighty God, often we look at our lives and we think that we are not valuable, we are not worthy, we are not good enough, and often we've tried to find the purpose of our lives in our own ways, with our own wisdom and understanding of life, while all the time you are crying out to us. Sometimes you are trying to meet us in our houses, sometimes on the road, sometimes speaking to us in the services, sometimes as we read the scripture. Help us, Lord, to hear your voice. Surrender our lives to you. Not be ashamed, but be proud of that we are your chosen instruments, that you love us recklessly. Lord, I just pray for your church today. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that as we will leave this building, we'll be able to say with confidence, I am thine, O Lord. I have heard your voice. That none of us will go and leave this building today purposeless, directionless, feeling worthless. But we'll be filled with the Holy Spirit to fulfill your purpose in and through our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Now receive the benediction. God's chosen instruments. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Now go and live out your purpose for Jesus Christ. Go in peace.